be defeating Jim's point of putting his phone up here. I, I got this opportunity given to me a, a couple weeks ago when uh, Greg was asking if he was going to have to be out of town, wanted to know if I wanted to pick up a Sunday night preaching, and I said, of course. He said, I figured you would. And Jeff and I did kind of coordinate, although we didn't, it wasn't like we sat across the table from each other and put our heads together. Um, Greg suggested, well, if Jeff's preaching on uh, the first part of Ephesians 4, maybe you could do something kind of complimentary of part 2 on Sunday night. And I thought, yeah, I think I can do that. And so I got some ideas about what Jeff was, where he was going with this and decided to, to approach at least somewhat the same subject. It was interesting this morning in our Bible class that the question came up as religion kind of grows and, and develops over time, what typically happens? And I think it was Jim that made the point that it tends to, to become more formal and ritualistic and all of those kinds of things. And it was interesting that he made that point because Jeff's sermon this morning touched on it and my sermon tonight is going to focus on that aspect of where 21st century Christianity has really gotten very much in our culture, um, maybe in a lot of other cultures too. I, I think that's probably true having traveled to Moldova and looking at the Orthodox Church and the nature of that particular church and certainly is true in other churches as well. But we're not unique in that sense because Jesus came into a culture in the first century that was very much a byproduct of a Judaism that had grown ritualistic in its practice. It had grown very formal in the way that it was carried out, especially by the Jewish leadership and the things that they emphasized and the things that they stressed. Jeff mentioned this morning what the Mishnah and then the, the, the second one was, what was the second word? It started with a G. Was it Gemara? I don't, know, I don't know. But anyway, there was the Mishnah, which is the Jewish traditions that they had developed around the Torah and the Scriptures. And then there was this secondary book that was essentially the rabbinic interpretations and explanations of the Mishnah or the traditions. And so it was a further building on that. And so it just goes to show you the kind of religious culture that Jesus came into. And I'm going to tell you, I don't have all the answers to what we do about that. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is point you to Jesus. I told Ashley, I said, I hope it's not a problem. All of the, less, all of the verses I'm going to use tonight come out of the Gospels. And they are all looking directly at the life of Jesus and how he interacted with people. Um, that's, that's the only thing we're going to look at. I'm not going to go to any of the epistles. We're just going to look at Jesus. Because the reality is that Jesus came into a world, a religious world, a Jewish religious world, that was very much steeped in tradition. And I'm going to present to you, I think, a Jesus that is accurate according to Scripture. I don't think I'm just selecting out some passages and utilizing them to make my point. I think this is indicative of the, the nature of the way Jesus came to be. And I hope that what you're going to find is what I found, which is that Jesus was very much non-traditional in the way that he presented Judaism before people. And there's a reason for that. I, I want to be really clear, and I'm trying to be really careful, because I know this is sensitive territory, and I know we have traditions. Those traditions, I, I don't think, I think if... I felt like they were a violation of some scriptural passage or principle. I would stand up and say something about that. And so our traditions don't violate scripture. There's nothing inherently sinful or wrong with them. And I want to make sure that we understand that. I am not preaching this lesson because I think we should throw out all tradition and that we should take the approach, one of the two approaches that some people have taken, which is, we either try to do things differently every single time that we meet so that we don't ever establish some practice ritual that we get in a rut and get stuck in. And so we're just constantly having to change things up 
in order to keep it from getting stale or stagnant or ritualistic. Um, the other thing that I'm not really trying to encourage us to do <clears throat> is change it because I don't like the traditions that we have and I think we need new ones. I, 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 that's not my purpose. That's not the point of this at all. In fact, maybe I'll just shut up for a minute. Well, I'm not going to shut up. I have to read to you because I'm not going to, I don't have anything to put it on the screen. So I'm going to read it to you. But I have a, a quote that I read recently by a man named Mark Boving. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right or not. But I, I thought this very much, because I have seen people who are opposed to church traditions because of those two other the reasons I gave. They don't like the traditions that we have and they think we need new ones. Or because they don't like the ritualistic nature of things and they think we just need to keep changing things up all the time so that we don't get in some kind of ritualistic rut. That is not my purpose. And, and maybe this will say it a little more eloquently than I can and than I am. He said this, and this is a little bit lengthier quote. I'm not suggesting that we grow soft on biblical truth. This is not about changing the truth. I want to stand firm on everything Jesus stood, up, stood firm on. But I want to be careful to say the things that Jesus said in the way that Jesus said them. I want to hold those truths in such a way that I actually look and act and feel to other people like Jesus. Here's a helpful rule of thumb, he says. If you find your theological convictions make you less like Jesus, then something's off. If you can't consistently live with your beliefs in such a way that your life looks like Jesus' life, then you're missing something. I am a conservative American Christian. There are very few areas where I've come to disagree with the Christianity I was taught growing up with, or even with my very conservative seminary training. But I have come to see numerous areas in which some aspects of that theology were wrongly emphasized or held with a si sinful level of certainty or wielded like a weapon rather than born in love and grace. And I've also seen many of my brothers and sisters and also myself turn to other battles that we, we have never been called to. I, I can say amen to that, having been guilty of some of the same things. And I, I think his sentiment, at least, is the sentiment that I want to, us to get across, or that I want to get across to us, and I want us to think about and consider tonight. And that is, do we look like Jesus? Do we sound like Jesus? Does the way we approach people look and sound and feel like the way Jesus would approach people? And a couple of the traditions that I thought of that I think, and Jeff mentioned them this morning, that I think really come to mind when I think about this. One is appearances. We in America are very much, and it's Western culture as a whole, are very much focused on form. We are focused on what something looks like. We expect certain things to look certain ways, and we can... We can we can spot a professional versus an amateur from a, from a mile away in our mind because we know what the form is supposed to look like. And we can, we believe, look at people who are churchgoers and we can tell the people who are serious about this stuff and the people who aren't just based on form. And by that I mean oftentimes the way they dress. Um, what, they, what they wear in our minds because of the, the upbringing that we've had and because of the culture that we've grown up in, we believe what they wear says a whole lot about how serious they are about religious things. That may or may not be true. And, and I would suggest that in the, the culture that we are becoming in a 21st century America, it is not likely a good indicator. And yet we still continue to use the same benchmarks in our minds and in our way of thinking and sometimes in our way of talking with people that, that betray the fact that we still see things very much in that sense. That how you dress when you come to church says a lot about how serious you are about religious things, about spiritual things, about God in general. And that is not a good indicator. I don't think Jesus walked into a synagogue and looked around at 
at people and made his judgments on where they were. And I know it's not really fair to use Jesus because he could look at somebody and know their heart. But I don't think he walked into a synagogue and looked at the people who were there and on the basis of how they were dressed or how they appeared, thought, well, they're serious about things and they're not. I don't think Jesus looked at people in that way. And if we want to be like Jesus, then we can't look at people that way either. And there are other traditions. That one kind of <clears throat> makes the point. And now what I want us to do is primarily focus our attention on these gospel accounts. I am going to make some comments about them, but I, I don't think I'm going to be stretching anything or taking any liberties in the interpretations that I make. If, if, I, if you disagree with me on that, feel free to talk to me about it. <clears throat> and um, if I make any statements that are not consistent with what is revealed here, I'll, I'll, I'll make an apology for that. But I, I'm going to try to stick to what I consider to be the facts based on what's revealed in these accounts, because I think they speak for themselves. I don't think there's a whole lot that I have to add to them to make the point that I'm trying to get across in this lesson that I'm preaching tonight. First passage I want to go to is John chapter 4. <clears throat> Many of us will immediately know where Jesus is, and we will immediately know what account this is, who it is that Jesus is talking to, and, and what's taking place on this particular occasion. <clears throat> A little commentary that I will give beforehand, in case you're not aware of the situation, I think most of us are, um, between Jews and Samaritans in the first century, there, there, was, there was no love loss. Uh, no, they, 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 they couldn't stand each other. And, and we could look at the history of why that was, but it's, it's not really important. The important point is, Jews and Samaritans didn't like each other. I have read books, his histories of Jewish people in the first century that suggested that for people who were traveling from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, many of them would opt to cross the Jordan River in Judea, travel up the east side of the Jordan, and then cross back over into Galilee to avoid having to pass through Samaria. And so they, that, that's, that's the kind of hatred they had for the Samaritan people. It is also not a secret to most of us to recognize that women in first century Judea were, were not really treated very highly. They were second-class citizens at best. Some of the rabbis considered them um, essentially all but useless other than forbearing children and uh, didn't, didn't mince words when it came to their disgust and distaste uh, for women, their testimony, and, and all of those things. So we find Jesus passing through Samaria in verse 4. It's interesting because the, the Gospel of John says, but he needed to go through Samaria. I, I'm sure there are a lot of Jews who read that uh, after it was penned and thought, no, he didn't. Go around. Why, why did you need to go through Samaria? But he needed to go through Samaria, and he came to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's about 12 o'clock for those of us who don't know the, the way that they counted time then. It's about 12, noon in the, 12 in the afternoon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. A woman of Samaria, read verse 7 again. A woman of Samaria came to the well, came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So there, I, I offered the commentary before, but it's right there in the text. Jews and Samaritans didn't like each other. Jews don't have dealings with Samaritans. And she is confused. How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, 
a Samaritan woman. I want to take it one step further and ask you to think a little bit more about this scenario, this situation. She will later say, you have nothing with which to draw from the well. So if Jesus, a Jewish man, is asking her, a Samaritan woman, for, for a drink, how does he intend to drink the water that she gives him? I want you to think about that. I want you to, to, to really just, I mean, it's just, it's kind of logical. He doesn't have anything to draw with. So likely he doesn't have anything to drink with. She is going to draw water from the well, and he is going to drink the water from the vessel that she draws it with, which is probably also the vessel that who else has used? Her and the man that she's currently living with and perhaps other people, other Samaritans. Jesus, a Jewish man, is going to drink water from a vessel that a Samaritan woman is going to draw up from this well. There's not a Jew, I don't even know that the disciples would have done that. In fact, they're shocked when they come back that he's talking to a woman. They, none of them say anything. <clears throat> but they, they're shocked that he's talking to this Samaritan woman when they come back to the well. Jesus didn't approach people from a traditional point of view. It's obvious in this particular account. And so he asks her for the water. Well, it gets, it gets better than that. Because the woman says, Sir, you have nothing with which to draw. Or no, for, I guess go back. Verse 9, The woman of Samaria said to him, oh, We already read that. Jesus then in verse 10 said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then will you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Jesus, a Jewish man, begins first stepping outside the lines of tradition by speaking to a Samaritan woman. He steps further outside the lines when he says, give me a drink, and intends to drink from her vessel. He steps even further outside the lines when he then goes on to discuss theology with her. She brings up a spiritual question. The Jewish rabbis would have said, a woman is not worth sharing theology with they they didn't consider them intelligent enough to discuss it and there was really no point after all she just has to follow her husband and do what he says and everything's good jesus doesn't take that approach the woman asks a spiritual question jesus gives her a a, an answer that is more than likely deeper than anybody could have understood at that particular time But he explains things to her in a way that leads her ultimately to draw 
the conclusion that I, I, I've read about or I've heard about the fact that the Messiah is coming. And when Jesus says, I who speak to you am he, she then leaves her water pitcher and goes off into the city to tell the residents about that and to bring them back to hear about Jesus. Jesus wasn't traditional in his thinking. He wasn't traditional in his approach. He approached people that the Jewish leadership would have never approached. He approached them with things that they would have never dreamed of approaching them with because, and we'll see this passage a little bit later, um, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his purpose for being here. And, and everything that he did, the, the traditions that he stepped beyond, it wasn't for the purpose of being abrasive or causing problems or being difficult with the Jewish leadership. It was because many of the traditions that they had got in the way of his mission, got in the way of clearly seeing who God is and what God wants for us as his people, and got in the way of his mission of leading, other, leading people to know himself and to know the Lord. And so we, with the rest of the account, she goes into the city. His disciples ask him about what in the world's going on. Um, then, then this massive group of people from the city of Sychar or Sychar come out to meet him. Based on, again, you can look at the history, the testimony of a woman was not admissible in court. And yet on the basis of this woman's testimony, a, a lot of people from this city come out to hear about Jesus and to find out more about this one who told her all the things that she had done <clears throat> and, and who she is and, and what her history was. And so they came out to hear about him and asked him to stay with them for a couple of days. Jesus wasn't traditional in, in the way that he presented. <clears throat> and I have no idea where. Do I lay my notes behind me? Go to Luke 19. <clears throat> Luke chapter 19. I was going to make a point earlier that I forgot to make, so I'll make it now while you're turning to Luke 19. Jesus wasn't anti-tradition. And what I mean by that was Jesus did observe, observe, observe some of the traditions of his people. I mean, for example, <clears throat> in John the 10th chapter, we see Jesus going to Jerusalem and even going to the temple at the Feast of Dedication. Now, I'll give you some background on the Feast of Dedication just in case you don't know what that is. It's typically referred to by Jewish people today as Hanukkah. <clears throat> but the interesting thing about Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication is that it's actually an extra-biblical feast or festival. And by extra-biblical, I mean you're not going to find any record of it anywhere in Scripture. The, the only place that you might find something about it would be in the, book, the apocryphal books of the Maccabees. And the reason is because it happened during that particular time period of history, about 200 years before Jesus. But the Jewish people, because of some things that transpired during the Maccabean Revolt, <clears throat> had instituted the Feast of Dedication, or Feast of Rededication, some would call it, uh, or, or Festival of Lights, it was also referred to, or Hanukkah. They instituted that a couple of hundred years before Jesus came on the scene. And Jesus, in John 10, is in Jerusalem and in the temple during the Feast of Dedication. Now, I started looking up some things about that to ask, did Jesus keep the Feast of Dedication? And I got exactly the response that I expected from some evangelical conservative Christians, which is, we need to be very careful about this in this particular passage because all it says is that Jesus was in the temple during the time of the Feast of Dedication. And so their point was, he was in the temple, but that's not necessarily because he was celebrating the Feast of Dedication. He could have just been there because there were a lot of other Jews gathered for that purpose, and he thought it'd be a good opportunity to teach. Okay, you, you, you can buy that if you want to, but a Jewish rabbi, and Jesus was by this time well known as a Jewish rabbi. There were a lot of people who hated him, but he was still considered a Jewish rabbi. 
a Jewish rabbi being in the city of Jerusalem in the temple during a festival, it would have been assumed by everybody who, who either knew him or didn't know him that he was there for what purpose? To celebrate the Feast of Dedication. And so I think that's a safe assumption. There's nothing in what Jesus says that indicates, I'm not really here for the festival, I'm just here to teach. And, and so I think it's, again, indicative of the kind of steps that we try to take sometimes in the evangelical conservative Christian church in trying to avoid things that make us a little uncomfortable. So my point in saying all of that was just to say Jesus did keep some of the traditions. There was, it wasn't as though he considered all traditions bad, but traditions that kept him from talking to women and from teaching women about the truth of God and sharing with them the nature of who God really is and the relationship God really wants, Jesus considered that to be a hindrance and an obstacle to the mission that he was given by the Father. And yes, he laid that aside. And he made no apologies about it. I came to do the will of my Father who is in heaven. That, that's my purpose while I'm here. And I'll do that wherever I go and with whomever I have the opportunity to do that. And so he did. And so we'll see even further. In Luke, the 19th chapter, beginning in chapter 19, verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. And he was rich. Um, I don't have to tell you what that meant. Uh, he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Um, I think Andrew's assessment this morning might have been right, that being a tax collector was not necessarily, in and of itself, a lucrative profession. It wasn't as though you were going to get rich by being a Roman tax collector. But the fact that it says of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich, likely implies that, that Zacchaeus had been skimming the coffers a little bit, in order to line his pockets a little more thoroughly. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into the sycamore tree, into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, who do you think they is in this case? I mean, think about what you know about the life and ministry of Jesus. When they saw it, but when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Truly, salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus went into the house of a sinner, and I would suggest to you that if you read the Gospels a little bit further, it was even worse than that. He went into the house of a tax collector. I mean, they, they hated tax collectors so badly, there was a whole secondary category of how bad a sinner they really were. I mean, read the passages, numerous passages in the Gospels that say tax collectors and sinners. Well, why would it distinguish that if they're all just sinners? Why distinguish between the two? Because in the mind of the Jew of the first century, and especially the Jewish leadership, the tax collector was even worse than them. He was the worst of sinners because he was also a traitor. And so tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus not only speaks with, not, uh, oh, and then later he says, salvation has come to this house. He speaks of salvation for this tax collector and sinner. But he not only speaks to him about these things, he goes into his house and he eats with him. And likely his disciples did too. Jesus wasn't traditional. 
He didn't look at the, the, the common status quo of what it meant to be a Jewish rabbi of the first century and try to tote that line and follow that line of thinking. Jesus saw a man who was searching for something, ultimately searching for him, and he took the opportunity to share it with him, share himself with him, and then to share a meal with him. And so he not only shared the message about who he is and what he's come to offer, but he shared himself with him um, in uh, spending time in his home. Jesus didn't take the traditional approach. And he says right here in this passage, the reason, verse 10, because the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He, he wasn't there primarily to outline all the right answers to what the law said and what this passage or that passage meant, although he did occasionally do that. Jesus' purpose was to seek and to save those who were lost, and he would do it with anybody. A Samaritan woman by a well, uh, a, a Jewish tax collector, chief tax collector. Maybe I should have been more specific. Okay, let's look at Matthew 12. In Matthew 12, we get at least a little bit of a glimpse at the traditional mindset of the Jewish people, and especially the Jewish leadership, when the Pharisees complain about the disciples seemingly grabbing a few heads of grain and rubbing their hands together to get the <clears throat> chaff off of it so that they could eat those handfuls as they were walking. And, and they say, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, not lawful according to their traditions. In fact, the Jewish traditions, the Mishnah, and the Gemara would have outlined all of the practices that were acceptable and that were unacceptable on Shabbat or the Sabbath. And this was one of the ones that was strictly forbidden. And so they see this and they say, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do. Now, I put this part of the passage in there and had Josh read it because I think we sometimes have a tendency to say, verse 6 says, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. And in verse 8 it says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I think we have a tendency to say or to read that and think what Jesus is saying is, I am God, I am the Lord, and therefore if I say it's okay for my disciples to do this, it's okay. And then right after this he's going to go into their synagogue and he's going to heal somebody. And if I want to heal on the Sabbath, I am the Lord, the creator of the universe. I'm not bound by the Sabbath. I'll do what I want. That is not what Jesus is saying. That is not what Jesus is saying at all. He is saying to you, as one who is greater than the temple is here before you, and as one who is Lord of the Sabbath, let me tell you what the Sabbath law really involves and entails. Let me lay out for you what is really an acceptable practice on the Sabbath and what is not. I, I think I know, since I'm the one who gave the law in the first place, what is an acceptable practice on the Sabbath and what is not. You claim this is not lawful, and in doing so, you uphold your traditions, Matthew 15, over the law of God, which was revealed, and you make the Sabbath binding in ways that God never intended for it to be bound. And so Jesus is clarifying to them the nature of the Sabbath and the practices that are acceptable. He's not saying it's okay for me to violate it because I'm the Lord. He's saying this, as the Lord, let me tell you what is lawful and what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And so immediately after this, he goes and departs from there and went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Okay. So they got the first point that he made. He said, essentially, what they're doing here in eating this grain, that's okay. So now he goes into the synagogue, and there's a man with a withered hand. <clears throat> and they ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Let's see how far you'll carry this, Rabbi. And it says, they asked him that, that they might accuse him. 
And he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? You think that's a rhetorical question? You think he's asking a question he knows they're going to answer and say, Well, I mean, of course, if I, had, if I had a lamb and it fell into a pit on the Sabbath day, I'm going to lift it out. I'm not going to leave it there to die overnight. I'm going to lift it out. And so verse 12, he says, Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. And the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Now, <clears throat> there is a, at least another occasion where Jesus has the opportunity to heal on the Sabbath. And, and the Pharisees come to him, or come to the one who's coming to be healed, and they say, are there not six days that you can come and be healed? Now, I'm asking you that question. Are there not six other days? Can, could, you, could he not heal them Sunday through Friday? Yeah. So, so then what's the problem? I mean, if, if, this is, if it doesn't really matter which day he does it on, why not do it on Sunday through Friday instead of on Saturday, which was the Sabbath? And the answer is because their tradition that they were binding on people was getting in the way of people really understanding and knowing the nature of the relationship God is seeking for us. And, and he makes the point here as well. If you would help a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? And so he's impressing upon them as well the value of people and the compassion and care that we ought to show to one another in doing good for each other and not using laws like the Sabbath. And they were, they were good at this. Matthew 15 one of the things that they do is they had made a tradition that said, if I, if I dedicate something I have to the Lord, then I don't have to give it to my parents to honor them. Called Corbin. They, they were really good at making traditions that essentially allowed them to step outside of their responsibilities to fulfill the law of God, whether it was honoring their parents or doing good to people. Well, I can't help you today. Because it'd be a violation of the Sabbath. I know you really need it. I know, you're, I know the, the, the situation you're in is kind of an emergency, but it's the Sabbath day and I really can't help you. And Jesus says that that is a misinterpretation of the Sabbath. It's a misunderstanding of the nature of God. And it is a misunderstanding of our responsibilities to one another. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And in this case, to help a man who has a withered hand. And so he heals him. On the Sabbath day. <clears throat> Go to Mark 1 with me. Mark chapter 1. I love this one. I, I love all these. What am I talking about? Mark chapter 1. There are numerous occasions where Jesus heals a leper. I really like this one. Mark chapter 1, verse 40, beginning. And again, non-traditional in his approach. What do you know about leprosy from the Old Testament? I'm not asking what kind of disease as far as what specific skin disease was it and any of that stuff. I'm asking what do you know about what the law said about people who had leprosy? I mean, most of us know it from reading the Old Testament. They, they, were, they were essentially put out of society. They, they couldn't be a part of society because if anybody touched them or came in contact with them, even accidentally, they were made unclean by touching the one who was a leper. <clears throat> and so lepers were essentially put out of society. And I don't know that this particular occasion tells us how long he's been a leper. But the point is, however long it's been, he has been an outcast. And he has not known what it feels like to touch someone, unless he was just a, a cruel man who put himself in situations where it might, he might accidentally touch someone. 
just to feel human touch. I don't get the impression he was that kind of guy. So he hasn't touched anyone for a while, however long he's been a leper. And this leper comes to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, I want you to think about just that statement. He, doesn't, he does not doubt at all that Jesus has the ability to heal him. He says to Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. So he's essentially asking, Lord, are you willing? Will, will you heal me? I, I know you can. I know you can take this away, but maybe it's not in your will to do so. If, it, if you are willing, you can heal me. And Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him. And I know, we, we read that, and Jesus could not be made unclean by touching something that was unclean. The opposite happened. The thing that could never, ever possibly happen according to the law, if, if something holy touched something unclean, the, the priests understood clearly. If something that is holy touches something that is unclean, what is holy becomes unclean. And that's true in every instance except with Jesus. And when Jesus, the only truly holy one, with the Father and the Spirit, touched something that was unclean, what was unclean became clean. It was cleansed. And Jesus knew that. But He didn't have to touch Him. I mean, let's just acknowledge that. There were healings Jesus performed by just standing across from someone. There were healings that Jesus performed without even being in the same location. But on this occasion, to demonstrate compassion, Jesus reaches out and touches this leper, and he says, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. <laughs> then read verse 45. Is it any wonder? However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Can you blame the guy? I mean, I understand what Jesus was trying to do and what his purpose for saying what he said was but i mean if you've been a leper and an outcast from society and a man comes along god himself in the flesh comes along and touches you and restores your flesh and heals you how are you going to go about your life without telling somebody about what about what he's done and about who he is and so he goes about telling people and i don't know you you can feel how you want to feel about that but that's what he ends up doing. Jesus touched a leper, which, again, I recognize nobody else could have done without becoming unclean, but they wouldn't have done it in even, even with a willingness to become unclean. They might have done, I mean, they became unclean in burying their loved ones. And there were people who willingly did that at the death of Jesus just prior to the Jewish festival that was beginning. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And there were women who on the day after the Sabbath went out to the tomb intending again to defile themselves by touching a dead body. And so people did that. They were willing to become unclean in certain instances, but Jesus was willing to reach out and touch this man on this occasion. Not traditional. In John the seventh, or Luke the 7th chapter, last account, last, last instance we'll look at, Certainly not exhaustive of all the non-traditional thinking of Jesus and approaches of Jesus, but I think these make the point. <clears throat> Verse 36 of, John, of, of Luke, it is Luke, I promise. Luke chapter 7 and in verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. 
And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. I just want to acknowledge right off the bat that Jesus wasn't uh, against going into Jewish leaders' homes and eating. Yeah, he ate in the home of Zacchaeus and ate in the home of Matthew and Peter and seemingly others of his disciples who were just the common people of the Jews. But he also spent time with Nicodemus and he ate in this particular Pharisee's house. And so he was not against doing that. But as he's there, verse 37 says, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she, saw, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, or the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. The point is, Jesus is in the house of a Pharisee. This woman comes in whom it is obvious the city as a whole, or at least the Jewish leadership, recognize this woman is a sinner i don't know what her sin is but it must be something obvious and that would have been shunned in the society that they were a part of and yet she comes in and she weeps on jesus feet and she wipes them with her wipes the tears with her hair and then she pours fragrant oil on his feet And Jesus allows it to happen. And, and Simon even looks at it and says, if this man were a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is, and he wouldn't let her do this. And yet Jesus allows all of it. And then he shares a lesson with Simon about the nature of God and the nature of the forgiveness that God is extending. But again, my point in using this account is this was a Jesus who wasn't traditional. Why, why let her do that? Why allow this to take place? And the reason was because Jesus saw it as an opportunity to teach. He recognized the faith of this woman. There was something about him that she understood. I don't know the depth of it, but there was something about him that she understood that led her to want to honor him in this way, and Jesus permitted it to be so on the basis of her faith. And then he honors her because of it. Honors her before the Pharisee and honors her in the fact that he says, your sins are forgiven. And so Jesus was willing to step outside of traditional thinking, outside of traditional bounds and practices in order to reach people with the gospel of Christ. And I submit to you that we need to be willing to do the same thing. We need to be willing to examine our own practices and traditions and where those traditions hinder our ability to look like and sound like and feel like Jesus. We need to be willing to make changes. Maybe changes in our practice. Maybe simply changes in the way we think and speak. Because sometimes it's just our speech that betrays us. It's not as though we have a dress code here. 
that demands that you wear certain clothing or you're going to be banned from coming in the doors. But our speech sometimes betrays that in our minds we have a dress code we think people need to adhere to. And if they don't, then that says something about who they are and about what they really think about God. And we need to change the way we think and the way we perceive people. I appreciated the direction the Bible class went this morning in thinking about prejudice on the basis of James and looking at the, the broader context of what that can really mean um, in the way that we approach people and in the way we think about people and in the way we treat people. Um, and I, I think it's important that if we want to be like Jesus, we be willing to make some of those kinds of adjustments in our thinking, in our speech, <clears throat> and um, where necessary in our practices. I can't think of anything immediately that comes to mind that says that that practice needs to be changed. But where our practices are a hindrance to us being who Jesus called us to be, and and revealing Jesus to the world, which is our task and our mission, then we need to be willing to change those things in order to honor the God who has sent us, the Christ who has sent us on that mission and began it himself when he was here 2,000 years ago. That's who we're striving to be like. There, there, there is no greater compliment than for somebody to be able to look at your life and mine and say it is obvious that you are a disciple of Jesus. It's obvious that you are a Christian. There is no better compliment that they can, they can offer you or me. And unfortunately, sometimes because of the traditional mindsets, the, the, the formal way in which we think about religion and the things of God, we have gotten in our own way and have gotten into, in, in the way of the mission of the Lord in reaching those who are lost. And, and we need to stop. Um, if we want to grow, if we want to see the kingdom grow, we're going to have to modify the way that we live and the way that we think, and maybe sometimes the way that we speak, so that we're not doing injury to the cause of Christ and casting out people before they ever get a chance to be in. Jesus would say of the Pharisees, whatever they do, observe and keep but don't do what they do because they say lots of things and don't follow them. And I think that's important <clears throat> because it makes a, a clear point for us. There are lots of things that we say, and it goes back to what Jeff's quote this morning was. We speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent. And then you had that extra stuff at the bottom that says uh, seeking to leave out traditions and all that kind of that is a ridiculous statement. There are absolutely a number of things that I can point to at this very moment that we do every Sunday, that we practice every week, that are purely on the basis of tradition. I'm not saying they're outside of scriptural bounds, but there are areas where God has spoken generally that we have interpreted and are following on a traditional basis. We use songbooks, and we have PowerPoint, and we do stuff like that. Where are you going to find any of that stuff in Scripture? We think the scriptural time to meet on Sunday night is 5 o'clock. Why do we think that? Because that's the practice that we've had now for years. Guess what? When I first got here, it was 6. Now it's 5. We believe the only name you can have on the front of this building is Church of Christ because God knows that's the only one in Scripture. Actually, it's found once and it's found in the plural. And the majority of times it's Church of God. I'm not saying Church of Christ is a wrong name. I'm saying when we believe that it is the only name we can wear in order to honor God and be God's people in a faithful way, we have put tradition above Scripture and we've done exactly what Jesus stood against and strove not to be when he was living here. Part of the establishment and part of the problem. Again, I'm not saying any of those things we do are wrong, but they are all according to tradition. Even the name. Okay, it's in Scripture, in the plural, and we drop the S and use it in the singular. But we 
have the name because of our traditions. I'm not saying the tradition's bad, but it is a tradition. And so that statement is absolutely ridiculous. We do lots of things that are not direct and explicitly stated in Scripture. We do them with authority, I believe, from Scripture, but they are still traditions that we've come up with in this location. And binding those as though they are the gospel is doing exactly what the Pharisees did in the first century and exactly what Jesus came to stand against in his mission to lead people to know God. Let's strive to be more like Jesus in the things we say, in the way we look at people, and in the way we conduct ourselves. So that people might say it is clear that you are a Christian, that you are a disciple of Jesus the Christ. If you're here tonight and have some need that we can help you with, if you would come and let us know how we can assist you, while together we stand and sing.